Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another We Can workshop. Today, we're talking about Know Your Numbers with a woman who knows her numbers. Judith Pinot, we're so excited to have you with us today. Thanks for joining us. And of course, everyone in the room today, thank you so much for carving out time. We know it's easy to sign up for these workshops and then not show up. So give yourself a high five that you showed up for yourself today because this can really be a game changer for you. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Carrie Ramsey and I am the project manager for the We Can Project, which is led by Queen's University and is funded by FedDev Ontario through the Women Entrepreneurship Strategy Ecosystem Fund. So I'm so excited that you've joined us today. And why don't you let us know right now in the Zoom chat where you're connecting from? Because I know that we have women entrepreneurs from a broad region. And so not just in the Kingston area, let us know. As well, if you have a business that you'd like to share with us, we'd love to turn these into networking opportunities as well. And every now and then in the Zoom chat, we see people who are trading email addresses or making plans. So that's what this is all about. Yes, it's a great learning opportunity, but it's also a great chance for you to meet some other women entrepreneurs especially since our networking opportunities have been severely limited by COVID right now. So take full advantage of today's workshop. While you're taking a moment to do that, I will acknowledge that I am connecting to this workshop from the Bay of Quinte region. And this is the traditional territory of the Huron, the Anishinaabe, and the Haudenosaunee peoples. And so uh, for the past 18 years, my family and I have had the privilege to live, work, and play on these lands. And just as we're talking about the land acknowledgement today, I actually want to mention that this evening we have a special workshop that we're offering through the We Can Project um, and through our Quaybiz program, which is our program for Indigenous women entrepreneurs. So if you haven't yet signed up, I'm going to drop a link into the Zoom chat in a moment. But the focus of the workshop is protecting your brand from a copyright, trademark, and um, and patent point of view. So Angela Lyon will be doing the uh, presentation tonight. It's online and um, I will drop the link there. There's a limited number of spaces because they like to keep them small and intimate. However, if you are an indigenous woman entrepreneur, you do not want to miss this workshop with Quaybiz, which like I say, is a part of the We Can Project and what a privilege it is to uh, work with so many Indigenous entrepreneurs, and some of you are here today, I know. So thank you for taking the time in the Zoom chat. I see that's blowing up, and uh, we do have some folks in the waiting room still, so I'm going to turn my attention there. Judith, uh, welcome. It's so great to have you with us again. The last time, I should mention, Judith did a workshop with us was in person, so it's been a couple of years, uh, but <laughs> welcome back, Judith. I'm going to hand you the virtual floor now. It's so great to have you with us. Thank you very much, Kerry. That, that's just absolutely terrific. And I see Florina there. And we were at that workshop, Florina, and that's when we met. And oh my goodness, I can tell you that it was the 28th of February, because it was just a couple of weeks before everything shut down. And that is the last time that I was able to do a workshop in person. And for those of you who know me well, I'm a real walker and talker. And I like to go around and interact with everybody. So I find this Zoom business really difficult. <laughs> so I'm still going to try and interact with you as much as I possibly can. So I'm going to keep scrolling through and having a look at everybody. And I will be asking questions and asking for a show of hands or, or just, just your reaction, um, because that will really help me to know where I should be should be going more with with my topic so for those of you who um, have not met me before my name is Judith Pino and I am a serial entrepreneur although I did start my um, early career um, in a corporate structure in a large global recruitment firm and I have to say that I give credit to the owner of that firm and my mentor at that time for shaping me very much into the businesswoman that I am today. But that was Drake International and Bill Pollock. And Bill is still with us. And actually, I spoke to him a couple of weeks ago. He's 92 years young and he is still running his business globally. And um, when I asked him when he was going to be in Toronto next, because I'd like to have dinner with him, he said, unfortunately, he was just off to Australia and didn't think he'd be back for six months. So there you go. 
why did I connect so much with Drake? Well, I'll tell you why. It's because that's where I really learned how to use numbers to your advantage, to be able to grow your business, to be able to measure your business, to be able to help you in the decision making um, in the decision making process. So, Mr. Pollock, Bill um, is by profession a statistician. And he actually created the Drake Business School at his old alma mater, which is the University of Winnipeg. Um, and coming to business as a statistician, he wanted to understand what made things work. And he understood the concept of big data way before we even used the expression. So his idea was looking so closely at his businesses and measuring all of what we now call KPIs in order to be able to better grow and develop his business. So I learned my numbers, I think, from probably one of the best in the world. Um, Bill is also a, a founding member of the uh, YPO, Young Presidents Organization. And the YPO is very, very committed to education. So YPO are those young people that made president of their organization before the age of 40. It's a global organization and it is very much committed to excellence in management. So as a member of Bill's senior management team, I also got a tremendous exposure to all manner of different people. Um, Einstein's grandson once, who's nearly as bright as his grandfather, but all kinds of people, the very high ranking politicians, economists, you name it. So I, I got that really outstanding education, which taught me how to really love numbers and make them work. So I, I was 12 years with Drake. One of the other things that I really loved about the organization and why I think I, I gravitated towards it is because of the way that Bill managed the organization, your results generated your career path. So it, it, was, it was definitely a meritocracy and I liked that. And your profit and loss statement was truly what you tied your career path to. And I loved that as, as a woman and Bill promoted a lot of women, it truly meant that it was a very objective way to measure, measure my performance. And if my performance was good and it was ranked, everybody knew exactly where everybody else stood, then the promotions would come along. So I started working for Drake in, in London, in the UK, in a staff position in a training role, very quickly moved over into operations and was asked one day if I'd like to transfer to Toronto. And it took me about a nanosecond to say, so I'd love to go to Toronto. So that's how I ended up actually in Canada. So in Toronto, I moved into a sales management role. Um, and quite quickly, as a couple of years later, uh, into a branch management role in uh, Vancouver. And from Vancouver, I was transferred to Melbourne, Australia. And a branch management role very quickly became state manager of the state of Victoria. I also had reporting responsibilities at that time in Australia, uh, New Zealand, which reported directly into me. Um, I opened the Hong Kong and the Singapore offices for Drake, which was really incredible. And I'd never worked in the Asian market before, but it was really quite spectacular. I had a six month assignment in South Africa, which was a turnaround operation. The operations in South Africa had always been um, very uh, robust, uh, but their senior um, manager had retired and they'd had difficulty really replacing her. And so it was a little bit of a rebuilt situation. Uh, I have to mention to you at this moment in time too, is it, it's so, it's so, it's so on everybody's mind. I actually had the incredible privilege of meeting Desmond Tutu, who was a personal friend of Bill Pollock's. 
and with his passing so recently, it sort of brings that flooding back to me. What an unbelievable human being. Anyway, I digress. So from Australia, I was asked to come back to North America and I actually had um, all of the staffing divisions, North America, so Canadian and US operations. And um, that was where I retired from. And why did I retire? You say, because my husband and I wanted to get married, we'd actually known each other for 10 years before that happened. But at some stage, I had to decide what I was going to do for the rest of my life. And as much as I loved my Drake career, and I loved being so mobile, I truly did live in an airplane. And all of the cities that I've just talked to you about, I went sight unseen. So I just showed up on an airplane and said, OK, well, I guess this is where I live. Um, so I, I had the need to settle down. And we always wanted to live on a farm property. And we looked at the price of farms north of Toronto and it was, you know, there was no way we could work until we were 100 years old. We were never buying one of these properties. So we started to look at communities that we, we liked and we found Kingston. Um, my husband is an engineer with a speciality in fluid power. And we looked at the marketplace here and there was a definite opportunity to start the business. So 30 years ago, this is 1990. Um, in those days, um, Kingston was very much an R&D center. So um, Alcan R&D was present, um, DuPont R&D, obviously Queens was a major client of ours, um, Royal Military College. So we looked and we decided that there was a definite opportunity to found a business here. So that's what we did. Now that said, and I co-founded with Pierre, um, I also had a, a consulting firm called Frontline Strategies. And because I had so many clients, in Toronto, I ended up really wearing two hats for about the first 10 years of our business here in Kingston. And I would go backwards and forwards and uh, look after my clients in Toronto. And um, mostly what I specialized in then, you'll be surprised about this, was financial management and modeling, APIs, and also quality assurance, which is a real um, passion of mine and process development. Um, and my clients included Ernst & Young, Smith Lyons, Bell, and a number of other quite significant companies. Uh, but again, I had to make a decision. Um, uh, EFP Eastern Fluid Power, our, our family business, was growing rapidly. And if my husband was here, I would say it in front of him. He's a brilliant engineer. I always say that he's half his dad and half his mother because his father was very much analytical and his mother was an artist. And that really is what he brought to engineering because he would look at problems with an artistic view and find incredibly creative solutions. So he loves that part of the business and he's brilliant at it. He didn't like managing people. He doesn't like reading a financial statement, although he's very financially literate, but he just doesn't like doing it. And he's, he's not, he is very good at marketing, but it's not his favorite. So his favorite is to find him an engineering problem that nobody else can solve, bid it, and then he'll work out how to do it after he's got it. And he used to scare me to death when I found out that that's how he operated. But I, I, I learned that, that that was what he loved. So we were at that critical stage in our business and the business had been running at about a million dollars, 1.2 for about 10 years. And it wasn't growing. And it wasn't growing because care was resourced out. You know, you get to that point where there's only so much one person can do. So at that time, I agreed to join the firm full time. And initially, I had the role of general manager, which meant I had all of the people. <laughs> and I also got to look after the money and the financial management of the business. And again, as we grew and became more process driven, um, I also implemented uh, ISO 9001 at that time. Um, we needed more structure again in the business. 
So I assumed the role of Chief Executive Officer in 2012, January the 1st, 2012. And I became a 50% shareholder in the business at that time. I had not previously held shares in the business, uh, but I decided that I needed to have some skin in the game. So that's what we did. So from that 2012 through to when we sold, which was a planned sale in 2019, we tripled the business. Tripled it actually nearly in the third year out from that restructuring. So that's what running the numbers really can do for you. And when we sold the business, we were just under 5 million. So there you go. So that, that's the story. So. I want a show of hands, or I just want everybody to make sure nobody's asleep. How many people here actually have an accounting package that they use in your business? I, Vicky, I know you. Brooke, I know you do. Uh, <laughs> uh, Chantel. Okay, I think most people do. Okay. And Ms. Victoria, I know you do. Okay, super. All right. Now, of those of you that are actually operating with an accounting package at the moment, do you use it very much? Do you read those reports or, or is this something that you're just learning about? Going to have a look in the chat if you want to find, yeah, Natalie's going, yeah, so-so. Okay, perfect. All right, then I, I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to start at the very basics and I'm going to go through what constitute uh, what constitutes uh, financial statements. And at the end of each section, I'll leave a little space and Kerry's gonna help me here for questions because I want it to be really relevant for you so that you've got good take home material. So, okay, so. <clears throat> We talk about, and you'll hear people talk about financial reports. And broadly speaking, financial reports consist of three different reports. And those of you that have an accounting package will be able to produce these at the end of the month for, for yourself. The number one report is your financial statement, which is often called a profit and loss statement or an income statement. And in order to confuse you better, different people use different words for it. The next report that is part of that suite of reports is your balance sheet. And the third report is your cash flow statement. And for those of you who end up dealing with a corporate bank or any form of investor, these are the documents that those investors will want to look at uh, to determine whether they think that you're a good risk to, to lend money to. We're also going to talk a little bit about today our accounts receivable and our accounts payable aged statements. They are, they're not part of the financial report suite, but they are extremely important reports that you need to have your finger on while you're managing your business. And we're going to talk about KPIs. <clears throat> and the reason that we're going to include KPIs here is that many people divorce their key performance indicators from their financial analysis. And in an ideal world, you want to be able to combine some of these figures that you want to quantify. So that is very, very important when you look to set up your accounting system and how you actually format your financial statement. So we're going to talk a little bit more about that. So <clears throat> this is a very typical financial statement or profit and loss statement. I just pulled it off the web. I think it was on Oh, here we go, Corporate Finance Institute. <clears throat> now, what does a financial statement or a profit and loss statement do? Very simply, it captures whether you're making money or not making money in your operation. And it is a statement 
that is for a set period of time, unlike some of the others that we're going to have a look at. So it is a snapshot of your business in a set. Excuse me, I'm just going to take a little bit of excuse me here. You can tell that I'm not used to presenting, can't you, hey? Because I lose my voice so quickly now. <laughs> Excuse me if I croak away. Yeah, so your bottom loss statement is always for a set period of time. The general period of time that you use to capture that data is a month. However, there's nothing and nobody that tells you it has to be. Some businesses will capture it daily because their business is so fast and churn so quickly, they will actually pull this statistic on a daily basis. Others will pull it weekly, most pull it monthly, some will do it just quarterly. You can do it annually, but don't. I will skin you if you leave it that long. So <laughs> it's all about. It captures whether you're making money or you're not making money in your operation. So if you have a look at, at this example that we have here, and I'm pulling up my little laser point, this is an example of a profit and loss statement that actually gives us all of the months of the year. So what you see here at a snapshot is how you've done for a complete year. I really like this form. All of you that have a standardized um, accounting package will be able to pull up your profit and loss like this. In the beginning of the year, you're only going to have January, then you're going to add February, then you're going to add March. Why do I like this particular form instead of just looking at a month in isolation? Because it's really a great form to see trends. And trends is what you're going to be measuring in order to know where your business is going. At the top, always, on the left-hand side, you will have your revenue streams. So here you see revenue stream one, revenue stream two, returns, refunds, and discounts. This is more applicable in the retail end of things than in other businesses. And then, so, okay, so along here, that's your total sales, okay? So you can see here that this particular business was on a nice big growth trend. They went from 711, 722, 734, 746. And you can see that immediately by having a look at, at this particular report. The next section here is called cost of goods sold. Now then, in your business, when you're selling your goods or your services, do you have costs that are only there if you make a sale? So let's think about what that might be. So let's say that you're in the food business, then the ingredients you buy to make that sale would be a cost of sale item. It is any amount of money that you have to spend in order to generate your product or service and make the sale. Now then, why is this important? I would have to say that for 80% of businesses, this line here that we call gross profit is the most important line that you need to be intimate with on your profit and loss statement. Because what that line tells you is the money that you have left over to run your business after you've paid to make your goods or provide your services. And the ratio between the cost of your goods sold and your total revenue, and therefore the gross profit that you're left over with are critical. This is where we get into margins. And I'm sure that all of you have, have heard a lot about margins. So, <clears throat> Margins vary dramatically dependent on the sector that you're in. So let's take um, SAS, S-A-S, S-A-A-S, for instance. 
margins, in other words, the money that they're left over with to run their business after their cost of sales can be in the 95% mark. So in other words, delivering or paying for the product and service costs 5% of their total sales. And they're left with 95% of their total revenue to run their business. Woo this is, by the by, why venture capitalists like them so much. But we digress. So <clears throat> most businesses operate at around the 50% mark. Some businesses that are more narrow uh, margin businesses can go down as low as 15%. But if you have a business model that is in the margin area of under 50, 40, 30, 20, 15 even, you need to be a high volume business. Because that only starts to make sense financially when you have the volume that you're generating sufficient revenue that you can live on 15 bucks out of every 100 bucks sold. So one of the things that I work with a lot with the businesses that, that I help is really maximizing the gross profit. It's really reducing as best you can this cost of sales. It also gets into the areas operationally of just-in-time inventory and other different management tools that we use. But what I want to give everybody that I work with is the strongest growth profit line that we can possibly achieve because, as I say to everybody, you are going to work really hard for your sales. So wouldn't you rather have a higher percentage gross profit for all that hard work that you're putting in than a lower one? Makes sense, right? Okay. So once we get at that gross profit level, then you simply have all the different expenses that you have to pay to operate your business. So on this example, which is about advertising promotion, depreciation, this is depreciation of equipment, usually could be depreciation of a building, whatever, insurance, maintenance, office supplies, rent. The biggest one, nearly always for all companies, is salaries, benefits, and wages, telecommunication, travel, utilities, and any others. Pretty straightforward. <coughs> In order to make profit with a company, you need obviously to be able to control these expenses. But once you have controlled those expenses as much as you possibly can, the only way that you can improve your profit position is to drive your top line. Drive the sales with a healthy gross profit. Because any additional money that you can put onto that gross profit line automatically drops to the bottom line in profit because you've already controlled all your expenses. You know what they are. You've managed them well. So extra money you make here automatically becomes extra money you make here. So it sounds <clears throat> simple, I know, but that's, that's what there is to it. So that gross profit line is absolutely key. Now, this example here is giving us Earnings before interest and taxes, and then earnings after interest and taxes, net earnings. We don't have to worry about that at the moment. Not important. We just want to know what our net earnings are at the end of the day, which is a simple case of taking your total expenses, deducting it from your gross profit, and what's left over is your profit for the month. So that is why this is called an operation statement tells you if you're making money in that set period of time that we've elected to measure. So it, it is it is your day-to-day -day document. It is the document that you want to be most intimate with in terms of how you manage your business. The other two documents, which we're going to cover a little bit later, the balance sheet and the cash flow statement, if this is healthy, they will be too. So this is the key report for you to drive and monitor and look at. And we 
We're going to come back to this moment. I'm going to show you. Um, Judith. To, sorry. Yeah. Just before we uh, go on, there's a couple of questions in the chat. Can I oh, just okay. ask some of you? Uh, so yes. the first one, Kokeb had asked, um, when it comes to shipping of goods, I'm just going up here. Um, yeah. Would shipping be an example of a cost of goods sold? Um, and uh, Natalia had answered, if it's shipping from a production line or warehouse to your store, then yes, it's a cost of goods. If you're shipping from your storefront to the customer, then no. So we're just looking for clarification there. And then I had a second question asked. It's, uh, Natalie's absolutely 100% correct. <laughs> Good, thank you. And the second was, um, if you have a grant or a tax refund that comes in, where would you put that? Is that, it's not really a revenue stream, <laughs> what, where does that go? Yeah, I would add it as a revenue. So I would add it down at probably the bottom here and before your net earnings. But that will also factor in on your balance sheet. Now, I'm gonna confuse you all for a minute, so I'll try not to, but okay. For the purposes of running your business, I do not put any of those revenues. So like any government grants or whatever that we might have had through COVID, I do not include them in my operational sales. They go onto the balance sheet, but I do not. It is a personal choice. Also, by the way, by the by, although there are accounting standards, you are the person that decides how to format this and what you put on. The reason that I do not include them as total revenue is because they distort the, re distort the ratios. Because if I'm looking at operational ratios and I'm saying, what is my business producing? It didn't produce a grant that we got from the, 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 the government. So I do not include it. And when I'm working with people that, that do have these kinds of um, initiatives, I deduct them out of the income statement when I'm doing my analysis. Okay, does that answer the question? Yes, that makes that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, so because it's, okay. it's not something you can come to rely on either. It could have been in one off no. grant and to get exactly. comfortable with that, it's, it's, it's bonus money is really what it is. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it is not as a result of your business activity. It's, we used to call it funny money, but hang on. <laughs> uh, uh, all right, this is the uh, uh, this is how I for, uh, format my profit and loss statement. And as you'll see here, this is actually mine, and I'll send it to everybody if you find it useful. I also use this for my financial forecast, exactly the same for because I want my financial statement, my profit and loss statement and my forecast to be mirror images of each other so that when I look at our actual performance, I can compare apples to apples to my forecast. Some accounting packages actually let you forecast within the accounting package. Not all do, but some do, which is terrific. So this is how I set up my income statement on my financial forecast. I look at my sales in streams one through four, or however many you have. And then I look at my cost of sales in the same streams. The reason that I do this is I want to very clearly understand which of my sales categories are most profitable. So if my stream number one has a cost of sales of 10%, that's very profitable. That means 90% of that sale is going onto my revenue line. Gross profit, net revenue, same thing. If my stream one of sales is a thousand bucks, but my cost of sales is 800 bucks, whoa, I'm only putting 200 bucks onto my gross profit or net revenue line. And by breaking it out in this way, it becomes extremely apparent which of your revenue streams are the most profitable. And therefore, I would suggest to you, the question arises, should we market that stream more? And perhaps even look at withdrawing from streams that are not as profitable. 
So that's, that's an immediate thing that you gain from here. Some of your businesses will have more complex uh, equations in the cost of sale category. Cost of doing business you might have uh, manufacturers chargebacks, all manner of perhaps more unusual kinds of charges. They all need to be factored in here under the appropriate stream. So you can very clearly look, um, dependent on your business, you could in fact even look at this as per all of your key accounts. And that's an interesting analysis to do. So break out your revenue stream. If you've got five key accounts, put the name of the account in there, put in the cost doing business or the cost of sale, and then include all your others as a, a one line item. And you'll very, very quickly see whether you're making money with that client or not. And very often we find ourselves in a position as uh, business women, um, that your larger clients like to squeeze your margins. They like to get it a little bit cheaper and a little bit cheaper. And so we can sometimes end up making compromises there that we really shouldn't be making because they're not healthful for our business. So that is how I actually do my forecast. And that is how my um, profit and loss statement is also formatted. Now, I also do something a little bit different in how I uh, format my expenses. I'm going to introduce a, um, um, a, uh, a statement to you at the moment. This line here, net revenue or gross profit, means the same thing, is a line that we use to measure our operations very critically. And you will hear accounting folk talk about stuff that's above the line, that's all of this, and stuff that's below the line, that's all of this. And you will hear that statement often. When you're looking at stuff above the line, you're expressing that and you're analyzing percentages of growth sales. When you're looking at the expenses below the line, if you're analyzing the percentages, you're analyzing the expense as a percentage of the net revenue or gross profit. So you, you'll hear that term, it's important. So when I look at expenses, I split them out actually three ways. Because, do you remember I said right at the beginning, that if you can build KPIs into your financial management structure, you're so far ahead of the game. You can't build them all in, and we'll talk about that later, but you can build some of them in. So KPIs for me is always measuring margins what is profitable business. And that is why that's so important to put it out there. Then I look at my operating expenses and I look at three different areas of operating expenses. I look at the variable operating expenses and they're called variable because they vary. And they're also, I like to call them decision fixed. It's something you can make a decision about. You can find a cheaper accounting methodology. You don't have to use a lawyer, you can go to the Queen's Legal Clinic. Um, your bank charges, if you're looking after your cash flow, your bank charges will go down. You could restrict the use of cell phones. They are things that you have some decision-making capacity over. As compared to expenses that are fixed, your rent or your mortgage, Anything that you have a legal obligation, binding obligation to meet, you can't change that month to month. It's just simply there. It's the cost of doing business. Then I split out as a separate in the variables, all of my sales and marketing costs. Now, why do I keep those separate, you might ask? Well, it goes back to Bill Pollock. Bill analyzed his business to such a finite way that he could drive his sales by placing his advertising sales and marketing dollars. Because he tracked the cost of onboarding every new client in the recruitment industry, onboarding every new candidate, 
how long it took on average to actually make a placement of a candidate, what revenues were generated from staffing. That organization can tell you how much it costs to recruit a, um, an accounting clerk in the city of Vancouver through the Vancouver Sun on a Monday morning if it's raining. The level of drill down that we went into to cost every marketing dollar that was spent and analyze the result that we got from it was that specific. We also then looked at a ratio which is called incremental. So play with me a little minute. If we know that we're spending $5,000 a month in sales and marketing, advertising, digital marketing, whatever, and that is consistently producing $100,000 on the top line, which is high, it would probably normally produce about $50,000. I then say, if I spend incremental money in sales and marketing, Anything that it generates over a ratio of one-on-one, -on -one, a buck to a buck, even if it doesn't generate a buck 30, I've driven the sales and I've increased the profitability. So if you want to grow your business and you are able to capture your data in such a manner, then the way you grow your business is through your sales and marketing effectiveness and budget. And that is why I split it out separately. Da -da. Uh, questions around that, because that's an interesting concept. And I, I learned it from a statistician. <clears throat> Judith, there are a couple of questions. Do you want me to slide them in now? Yeah, yeah, okay. let's. I think we all need a brain break. <laughs> No, it's fascinating. Uh, so Victoria has asked, should there be another cell to include margins on your spreadsheet? Where do you keep your margins on your reports? Yeah, um, and Victoria knows this. I drop in another column with the percentage either. So I would, between period one and period two, I would add another column and I would put the percentages in there. Okay. So it shows you your percentage margin. Yeah. And I'm assuming people know though those periods would be the quarters of the year, right? So January, February, March. Could be anything. Could be anything. Could be okay. January, February, March, April. I, I didn't go all the way across just to keep it simple and to give the concept. Um, but generally speaking, yes. Uh, and with Victoria, we 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 work with uh, Victoria's business both uh, on a basis of the month and a quarter. So there are different reasons why you would elect to look at trends over different periods of time. So um, back to Bill Pollock and all I learned from Bill, in the, in the staffing industry, in the recruitment business, we do it daily because it is, is such a fast-paced business. So you, you pick your time dependent on how important that is. Okay, so... Can anyone have any questions about that idea about how you use your marketing and sales budget to drive offline? Penny had a question, and I'm not sure it's exactly related to that, but Penny's question is, how would you handle large one-time investments, such as a new uh -huh. website, which is usually only done every few years, unlike platform expenses? So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, if your accountant will let you, you can amortize it over the period of time that you think it's going to be useful. So just divide it into that period. Um, I, for one, when I ran my business, did not amortize much. Um, I tended to want to expense it. Can we afford it? Can I expense it? Fine, I paid for it, done. Um, but there are times that you will choose to amortize large items over a period of time. And when we come to looking at the pub sheet, you'll see where that, that fits in there. Great, thanks, Judith. That's all the questions in the Zoom chat. Okay, all right. So let's move on again to our next report, the balance sheet. So we've already said that your profit and loss sheet tells you if your business is making money. It's your operational report. Your balance sheet tells me 
if you, how much you own and how much you owe. In other words, what you're worth. Now, most of you have probably been in a position where you've had to go to the bank and um, the bank manager will often ask, well, what assets do you have? What do you own? And that could be stuff like maybe you own a home, maybe you own a car, maybe you own a recreational vehicle. It's stuff. So these are considered assets. It's exactly the same when we're managing a business. What assets do we own? And then the other thing that the bank manager is going to ask you is how much money is still outstanding on all of that stuff. So how much is your mortgage? Do you have a car loan? How much money do you owe? Okay, because he wants to know your net worth. This report tells me the net worth of your business. It's exactly the same concept. So let's have a look at some of the things that, that come up on a balance sheet. The assets are always on the left-hand side of the balance sheet. The balance sheet generally is in landscape with the assets on the left, the liabilities to the right, and then the owner's equity, which is the important bit. We're going to talk about that. So in this particular business, that is in great shape, by the way, and we'll talk about how I know that in a minute. Um, cash refer to the money in your bank account, cash asset. <clears throat> Marketable securities, any that you hold, that's an unusual thing, but accounts receivable, that's the money your customers owe you, but they haven't paid you yet. Any inventories that you might have on hand and any prepaid expenses, stuff that you've paid ahead of time. That is called the total current assets. That's kind of important because what that means is it's, it's to do with your day-to-day -day operation. As compared to your non-current assets, which is your property, your plant, your equipment, accumulated depreciation. So that's long-term. Remember, we were just talking about that current situation. <laughs> excuse me again, a long-term situation. <laughs> Other assets, investments, patents and trademarks, which would be valued at higher than that. And the list of the total assets that your company owns. Then on the other side, on the right-hand side, we can say, okay, what do I owe? Well, your account's payable. How much you owe your suppliers? Any bank loans that you might have? Any accrued liabilities? That could be stuff like workers' compensation, government payroll taxes, taxes payable. <coughs> current portion, okay, current portion of long-term debt. So if you have, say, a loan from the bank or from FedDev, or from BDC that's payable in a five-year period of time, but is, has payment set annually, then some of that debt would show in your non-current area and some would show in your current. In other words, what you want to capture in your current assets and your current liabilities is your day-to-day -day assets and liabilities. And the reason that we capture that is because bankers like looking at that. It's called the current ratio. It gives you a very quick snapshot as to whether you're cash flow positive. We're going to talk a little bit more about that later. But so. Then you look at your long-term liabilities. So you come to a figure, which is the total liabilities. So here immediately I look and I say, okay, how much do I own an asset, 38,000, and how much do I owe folk, 12,000? So I say, wow, I own <coughs> more than three times what I owe. This, ladies, is a time for you to go to your bank manager and ask him to increase your line of credit. <laughs> and I'm not actually kidding, I mean it. What the bank always looks for here is they want you to have assets about double 
your liability. If your assets are three times your liabilities, they will be begging to lend you money. So if you end up with a financial year that you end up with a picture like this, this is what I would call a very pretty balance sheet. I literally do mean go to the bank at the end of that financial year, even if you don't need that money now. Because if your balance sheet is not that pretty, you ain't going to get the loan. Strike while the iron is hot. And, and, and I, I mean that with all sincerity. All right. You know, this is a little bit question. left out. Can yeah. I slide in a quick question? Now, I think it's already been answered in the chat. Uh, Vicky asked, inventories. Is this number before yes. retail markup or not? Um, and so someone had, uh, Sarah responded, it should be a cost because you can't guarantee what you'll sell it for. You're on track with that? Yeah, it, it's at cost. You might depreciate it. That depends on the business that you're in. Um, sometimes um, the way that inventories are valued too is a balance between what the inventory is valued as a sale item and its depreciated value. That's between you and your account and whatever works best for you in that regard. So, Do we want to talk about owner's equity? This is the great bit. Sure. So this tells you what you're worth in your business. And it's very, very simple. You just look at your total assets and you deduct from that your total liabilities. And that comes up with your owner's equity. It's a very lovely thing. So again, there are many different ratios that you'd look at in business, and we'll touch on some of them later. Some of them are more relevant to larger enterprises. Some of them are more relevant maybe to companies that are in the public sphere, where you're trying to compare one business's performance to another. But very simply, your balance sheet tells you what you're worth how much money you've got, how much money you owe, and the balance is yours. Okay. Any questions around that? We'll just pause for a moment. I don't see any in the Zoom chat. Nope, I think we can go ahead. And if you notice any, we can pick them up later. All right. Cash flow analysis. There are many, many different ways to do a cash flow analysis, and I'm not going to go into a great deal of detail about this at the moment. Simply speaking, and you will have this report in your accounting package if you have one. Simply speaking, it is a case of looking how much cash you have on hand at the beginning of the reporting period, what your expenses are going to be operationally during that period, how much cash you're going to receive during that period, and whether your cash position is going down or going up. It tells you simply if you have enough money to pay your bills, and it tells you how your cash flow is trending. It is not always a reliable method in some businesses. So let me give you a, for instance, in my old business, we used to do a lot of civil um, projects. So uh, we would take on a project that could perhaps go over a two or a three year projection with milestones for payment throughout. But those milestones were absolutely not kind of cash in situation. They could be very projected periods of time. So if you are a business, for instance, that does a lot of project work, then you, this is not a good way for you to do your cash flow analysis. But that's really something that I, I would pick up under a, a separate heading because it can be complex. This is very critical because it tells you if you can meet your bills. It is also something I do when I do my financial forecasting at the beginning of the year. And the reason that I do it is because I want to make sure that the cash flow is solid for the year, or yes, I do need to have a conversation with my banker if I have to increase my line of credit. This will often happen when your business is in a quick scale-up position. 
So if you're scaling up rapidly, you have to spend money to make money. This could put you into a negative cash flow position. So knowing that ahead of time, knowing that as you're planning and doing your strategy is really critical in terms of managing your business and making sure that you find facility to meet that cash crunch when you hit it. So in my particular situation, I did have an outstanding relationship with my banker. Um, and I had an outstanding relationship with my banker because I shared stuff. So he knew that he could trust me because I was open with him. And if he'd financed a piece of equipment for me, I used to bring him in and show it to him so he could sit and touch it and know that it, it, it really is critical. But so I have never had a problem with my banker if I've needed to increase my line of credit. If I've gone to them and said, here's my forecast. I already have POs for some of this. I know that this is closing. And um, by January, by February, by March, whatever it is, I'm going to hit a cash crunch because of the money that I need to put out in those months in order to realize a sale that might not happen until October, might not happen until next year. And I have never had a problem increasing my line of credit when I've done it that way because the bank manager says, wow, this woman is running her business and she's planning for this eventuality. So it's, it's a very, very key thing to do uh, that you take that into, into consideration. All right, <clears throat> just let me have a sip of water. Have I put you all to sleep yet? Someone has asked what bank that is, Judith. <laughs> Royal Bank of Canada, but my bank has since retired. Um, but the person that took over from him uh, was also equally as excellent. Um, when you first start your business, you end up in the small business department of the bank. One of your goals as a business owner is to graduate out of that as quickly as possible to the commercial division because the small business facilities that the regular banks offer are not very um, robust. You might get a small line of credit. You might get a credit card. You won't get much. You might have to send them your accounts payable and accounts receivable report at the end of every month. As soon as your business is at a stage that it has sufficient volume that the bank deems it appropriate that they move you over to the commercial division, and that is really when you start to develop those relationships. And Judith, what was um, the, what was the, you transferred so from small business to which division? Commercial. Commercial. Yes, yeah, someone had asked in the chat. Yeah. Great. Yeah, and. Different banks have different uh, protocols around that. If you're a fast track business and you're scaling up quickly, they might start you in the commercial division. Most startups end up in the small business category and you have to graduate to the commercial division when you will have many more facilities available to you in your business. It's generally speaking, depends on the bank, between 1.5 and 3 million in revenue, they'll move you into the commercial division. So that is a goal because that's when you, you really do, you, you have a relationship with your bank. Um, I will also add there as we go on to aging reports in a minute. If you have that kind of relationship with your bank and it takes time and energy like all relationships do, you will almost guarantee an intro to BDC. Because if you need additional financing, BDC work through your primary banker. They will only take a second position. If you have a good relationship with your primary banker, then you're in a very strong position to talk to BDC for additional funding because you've got this. And likewise, if you have a strong position with your primary banker, 
they will work with BDC and BDC will take a second position. So it, it has all kinds of benefits to it in terms of your ability to, to get uh, uh, financial uh, facilities. To take a moment again with all this <gasps> throat. Mm. Two reports that are not one of the three in the suite are incredibly important to you are your aging reports. And there are two of them. One is your accounts receivable, who owes you what? And the other is your accounts payable, who do you owe money to? And down the left hand side, this particular example, I think is probably uh, a receivables report, but they look exactly the same. It's just that one of them has your customers and the other has your suppliers. This one tells me that um, Amy's Bird Sanctuary owes me $239 and it slipped over the 30 day mark. So I need to give them a call, right? Bill's Windsor, bad on him, is now in the 30 to 60 day column. So we need to collect that money. It's called an aging because it represents to you who owes you money and for how long a period of time. Red Rock Diner, bad on them, over 60 days. So you really do need to collect that. Now, why is this important? Because that supports your cash flow. If you're not collecting the money that you're owed, then you're going to have cash flow problems, right? There's another reason it's important. So take poor little me that had some of these projects, some of them we didn't see money for for a year. I would end up with a tremendous amount of my receivables sat in the over 90 day column. And that's fine because I had a plan for managing that and I shared it with my banker and he knew about it. It was all cool and all the rest. If that is not the case, you're carrying a lot of old debt. First of all, that's very difficult on your business. But secondly, if you do go to your bank, they're going to deduct that from your financial position. They're going to say, it's not quite, I'm going to take it off the balance sheet. So managing your accounts receivable is a very critical part of doing your business. Likewise, on the other side of the coin, you have all of your vendors, your suppliers listed down the left-hand side here. And it would tell you when you're due to pay these folk. And some people have 60 day terms in some businesses, some people have immediate terms, some people have 30 day terms. It all depends on the market sector you're in. But that tells you what you're going to have to pay out this month. So do you remember when we were talking about current liabilities? This is where that comes from. That's what you're going to have to pay out. Judith, can we ask us a question here? Uh, yes. some, uh, Vicky has asked, how would you deal best with uh, the outstanding accounts receivable? It depends on all kinds of things. And it, it's, it's very difficult because you're managing relationship, right? So, but I will tell you, yeah. Can I ask Vicky what industry sector she's in? Sure, Vicki, you can uh, just come up. Oh, electrical contracting. Oh, yes. Okay. Well, you, you can take a very firm stance if you want, Vicki, and you can just put them on credit hold. Um, you've always, as you know, you've got to factor into the equation there. Will you lose the business? And are you prepared to take that risk if you put them on credit hold? Generally speaking, people in your sector, in industrial sales, that is very normal and nobody takes it personally, it's just the way it is. So um, we, you and I can pick that up as a, as a discussion afterwards if you would like. Um, but yeah, if you've got some recurrent uh, customers there that are always hitting your 90 days, I would give them due warning um, that you're changing your um, your protocol and that your terms are net 30, but if we haven't received your money in net 60, then their account goes on credit hold. Mm, great. And I don't like doing it, but I have done it. And I've done it to some big multinationals 
when I went, oh, should I be doing this? Am I jeopardizing my relationship? And the answer actually was no. It, it's it's a part of business. Mm. And it's ironic that sometimes you end up with more respect from your client because you've taken that position. Because believe you and me, they take that, that position with others. So. I hope that answers. Thanks for that, Judith. I knew you'd have a quick answer. There was a question asked, sorry, I don't want to go too far before we lose Chloe's question. And honestly, I don't know if you remember your reference, but you had mentioned one to $3 million in revenue. <laughs> uh, Chloe, I don't, do you remember saying that? And she was wondering, is that in revenue or not profit? Revenue. Okay, thanks. To to total sales. <clears throat> okay, any more friend more? Nope, that's all the questions that are in there right now. And Judith, right. just to let you know, you've got 25 minutes left. Oh, okay, thank you. All right, this is the fun bit for me. This is one of the reasons that you do all of that. And as I say, it's very often really not considered in when people establish accounting, uh, their accounting packages, and it should be. Um, as we talked about a little bit earlier in looking at different ratios, and I'll pop back there so it'll refresh your memory, there are certain financial ratios that are critical to maintain your operation. These are KPIs, key performance indicators. That's exactly what they are, that's all they are. So setting up your income statement, your profit and loss in a way that you're easily able to track your margins, even though you will have a margin report. It's a big, long document that is spewed out when, when you ask for it, which comes off your GL. But if you set up your income statement properly, you will be able to track a lot of those key, key performance indi indicators using your financial package. What are other things that we might like to track to look at the health of our business? So Maybe something useful in your business is units sold by the day, by the week, by the month. Is it going up? Is it going down? Do you want to track units sold by your different revenue streams? It's a very basic but very important thing for you to know. It helps you with your inventory management because it enables you to do a projection as to what you're likely to sell going forward. Um, new, new customers. You want to track the new customers you're onboarding. Why? Because it's really, really important that you know what who your new customers are. Also, when you go back to your budgeting, and we decided we were going to put an extra salesperson on the road, so our sales marketing budget went up by $3,000 a month or whatever, all right, well, how much is this great person bringing us? If their job is new customers, what's the relationship there between your expense and your revenue generation? Existing customers, are they growing? Are you losing them? Is there other stuff you can sell them? It's much easier to sell additional stuff for your existing customers and it's cheaper than to go out and find new ones and an extremely common issue that I find when I work with different businesses is that the existing customer base is unaware of all of the different products and services that the enterprise offers it, it happens all the time so customer buys x from you at the beginning of the relationship and you've done incredibly well and they think you're marvelous and they'll always go and buy X from you, but they don't know that you sell Y or A or B or C or that you do. So make sure that you're developing your existing customer base. Customer satisfaction ranking. What do they think of you? This is a lot about, almost about brand. It's when, when, you, when you think about brand, Brand really isn't what you think your business is. Brand is actually what your customers think your business is. 
So it's incredibly important that you have your finger on customer satisfaction. Um, and if there, obviously, if there are any difficulties there, that the, you have the proper processes to correct that. And I'm not going to talk about process control today because we'd be another 90 minutes. So we won't do that. Uh, but that's, that's a very important thing, obviously, uh, to know. Average dollar per sale. Uh, I would also add to that the margin because it's important to know what your average dollar sale value is, but it's also important to know what the margin is. Because if your average dollar sale is going up, say it used to be 50 bucks, but now your average order is 100 bucks, but your cost of sale has gone from 25 bucks to 80 bucks, you're actually losing money the more you sell. So I, I would, I didn't, me bad. I should add margin in there. I will on the next time I use it. Um, you might look at how many orders you receive today and what your turnaround time is. So how are they, how quickly are they shipped now? And obviously you want to look at your Google Analytics or any other data analytics that you might have. So these are only ideas of KPIs um, that you can measure. Um, I used to, in my business, we were an ISO business, so we had very strong uh, measurement systems in terms of quality control and customer satisfaction, inspections and all that kind of stuff. So we were pretty tight on that. I used to measure something called internal effectiveness. So I wanted to know 100% of our business was quoted. So that, that made it kind of easy. I wanted to know of all of the business that we quoted, how much of that did we fill and what cancelled and why? So that's an internal effectiveness ratio. Very critical because if you're pumping your sales and marketing dollars into your marketplace and it's generating orders like crazy, but you've got somebody on order desk or whatever that's just not filling them, then you're not only wasting your marketing dollars, but you're pissing off your customers. And I always used to say to everybody that a, a cancelled order is a cancelled account. You will not cancel an order with a customer long. So I used to measure that. <laughs> I used to measure average sales and margin by revenue type. I used to measure turnaround time. Um, yeah, so anyway... It doesn't really matter. There is yeah. one question here. It's not, I don't think exactly on KPIs, but um, Tegan has asked this question. She's launching a new business, YGK Takeaway in the Kingston region. Uh, she says, oh, I just lost it. We will be launching a commission-based platform similar to Uber Eats, DoorDash. When customers purchase goods on our platform from a merchant, we collect the money and then we keep a commission percentage and distribute the rest to the vendor. Mm -hmm. okay, I'm scrolling to the question. Uh, do we count the total of what the customer paid as our revenue or do we just count the commission as revenue? Um, okay, do you receive the total revenue? Does the revenue, all the revenue flow into your bank account or not? Uh, yeah, it does. Then you count it. If it goes through your bank account, it's your revenue. How it's distributed after that goes into the cost of doing business. Okay. So that's your margin situation. But Tegan, I'd be pleased to talk to you offline if you need help with setting that stuff up. Oh, that's great. Thank you so much. I'll make sure You're to connect welcome. with you. Joanne yeah. also has a question. What would be a good KPI for a service-based business? Can you elaborate a little bit more on the business, please? Joanne, you can just unmute yourself. Yeah, I'm struggling to find out good KPIs. Like, though I like the ideas here, but uh, it's basically coaching and uh, um, coaching, uh, career coaching and facilitation. Okay. And I would say that what you want to look at is your clients. Um, do they stick with you? Do you get repeat business from your clients? I, I don't, but I'd like to, because most of them uh, are transition. Uh, I work with in outplacement, they're tra transition clients where. Uh, okay. 
So they they once they find a job, that's it. But I think I need to implement some uh, follow up more. <laughs> Yeah, what I would suggest to you too is to, if you've not already, I would implement a scheme of uh, having your current client refer anybody else that they think might be able to use your services. So then if you monitor your rate of referral business, that will give you a, a very good indication as to your customer satisfaction. Uh, I would also look at your customer satisfaction measurement after you provide it services. I would also keep in touch with these folk. And this goes back to my old recruitment days, right? Yeah. Uh, I would keep in touch with these folk probably quarterly to make sure that everything is going well. Um, because yeah. you just, you never know, yeah. Yeah, I need to implement that, but you know, with the relationship with the outplacement, I, I'm not sure if I can do that, but I guess I, quarterly just uh following up that would that i need to implement something like that yeah yeah because really what you're doing is you're building awareness for your services now i ask you a quick question to john um who pays your bill the client or the or the individual it's the outplacement company okay okay all right but i'm yeah. also so creating the, i'm going to be creating also my own programs this year but right yeah. Okay, so your client then is actually not the individual, it's the outplacement company. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, so then you've got to see if you want to, if you want to uh, grow your profile in that area, if there are other outplacement companies um, that you can also provide services to. So then what I would look at is your growth factor, and I would measure that. Yeah, okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, anybody else asking questions, Carrie? Nope, that's it right now. So, common ratios that we you you will hear your uh, accounting people and bankers talk about in a small business. Um, the ratio that I am particularly interested in is the debt ratio, we talked about that earlier, which is your total liabilities divided by your assets. And two to one is good, three to one is a beauty. So that balance sheet that we looked at earlier, yeah, go talk to your bank manager if you've got a three to one debt ratio. The current ratio too is also uh, a good one to have a look at. And we looked on the balance sheet uh, at current liabilities and current assets. So again, that is current assets divided by current liabilities. These, these ratios um, are, are often used uh, by analysts that are comparing one business's performance to another. So in a small business, I would say that really where you need to focus on at the moment is your debt ratio and that that really is the others are not as important to you at this stage. So there you go. So guys, did I finish early? 10 minutes. So woohoo, woohoo. Everybody loves that. So that's me. Most of you know me, I think. But um, if you want to ask me any specific questions about your bit, um, email me or give me a call or whatever. Uh, and I'd be delighted to answer them for you. And I hope you found this useful. And I hope you can say now at the end of this that the numbers can be my friend. <laughs> because even, even though sometimes we don't like looking at it, because it's not as pretty as we'd like it to be, it does inform you about what you need to do next and where your priorities need to be. So it's a critical thing to get used to. The other thing that I would highly recommend that you do is that at the end of every month, when you've closed your month, so you know that all of your sales are in there, all of your expenses are in there, I want you to compare what you actually did to what your forecast or your budget was. And I want, to, I want you to ask yourself, 
why they were variances. There will always be variances. The important thing is that you as the business owner know why. Because if you know why, you can take remedial action. Or if the variance is, woohoo, that was even better than we thought, you can do more of the same. But it's really important that you go through that process. The other thing that I say to you as you go through your financial year is in that forecast that you did at the beginning of the year, as you start to get your actual results, plug in your first quarter of actual results and have a look at what you forecast for your second quarter. Do you need to adjust it? Are you on track or are you not on track? And if you are on track or you're exceeding your budget, woohoo, more of the same. If you're not on track, you need to know why, because maybe you need to take some remedial action. If you do that every month, you will find by the end of a year that you know your business so intimately that when you come to forecast next year, you will be able to do it with ease because you've taken the discipline looking of what you thought would happen what really did happen what's the difference and that's the process of management it really is so start with what you know even if you say well i, I don't know how to do a forecast for a year take your best estimate you'll be surprised how good your instincts are but then measure against it that's when you really learn about your business so thanks Judith. that's, that's all awesome. sure uh, somebody yeah, that's what she wrote. more than one person has asked um, if they can get copies of those templates that you provided. And I know that you'll you had said you would provide the PowerPoint presentation. Um, yeah. And I think you want people to connect with you directly, correct? If uh, they yeah, that's fine. Yeah, that's fine. And if you want my forecast spreadsheet, which has some of the formulas already plugged in, uh, I'd be pleased to give you a copy of that. All right, so uh, please do write down that email address, judith at kos.net, um, and people can reach out to her directly. I think that would be best. Uh, you know that you can get the recording uh, on our YouTube channel, and so I have dropped that into the chat a couple of times, but if you're, you still don't know where that YouTube channel is, uh, just send me uh, an email. I'm the one that sent you out an invitation for today. And... Um, so yeah, definitely connect with Judith, uh, and uh, she is definitely a fountain of wisdom, and we're so grateful, Judith, that you've taken the time to share this with us and for the generosity um, of your time that you spend with so many women entrepreneurs to help them, whether it's in the Weekend Project or outside of the Weekend Project. And a final note that I just want to throw out to you folks, especially if you are a Weekend client you know that you have access to the free Facebook group, right? So we have always people saying, Carrie, I need an accountant. I need a bookkeeper. I need, you know, you, I would suggest you post your question in the Facebook group because every time someone says, I need a web designer, I need this. There are women who rush in and say, this one's excellent. This one's great. You know, so um, I can answer the question and give you three referrals, but even better I find is when you post it in the Facebook group, and allow that crowd sourcing of information to happen because then other people notice it as well. So Judith has mentioned very important points today. Accountants, bookkeepers, build your team. We want to help you grow for success. So thank you everyone for attending today. Uh, it has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you, Judith, for your time. Uh, and enjoy thank you, everyone. Thank you. Awesome. Take care, everybody. Bye -bye. Remember to count your money. <laughs>